it's been a total takeover this uh, pandemic because of course as a big virology institute we have immediately diverted our programs to the pandemic research and and response so since january 2020 my business has been full-time COVID, with maybe a little bit of time for other things and the work-life balance is just totally off <laughs> and i'm looking forward to restoring some of that in the months to come the vaccines have differences in the way they work uh, and in the way they offer the part of the virus to the immune system but they also have similarities so the similarity is that they all include the spike protein, a piece that sits on top of the virus particle, and that's really important target for our immune system to block uh, new infections uh, if we develop immunity. And the vaccines have different ways of offering that piece of the virus. There's the mRNA vaccines that offer the genetic information directly, just packaged in a protected layer of fat essentially lipids and there's the vaccines in which a common cold virus is used to bring that same information into the body and then to the immune system and there's a third category of vaccines that where the protein is made in the laboratory and then put into the vaccine What we can go by is the information from the clinical trials and from the first post-marketing surveillance studies. So what we see is that the vaccines so far seem to have a very similar effect uh, when you look at protecting from severe disease. So the number of hospitalizations, uh, ICU admissions and uh, deaths really go down in people with uh, full vaccination. From the trials, it looks like they may be a bit different in how well they protect from infection. So whether or not if a person is vaccinated still can replicate the virus. There, there seems to be slightly more difference. What exactly that will be, we will have to learn in the coming months. Current priority is really get vaccinated when you can. <laughs> there is a lot of discussion now about the vector vaccines, the vaccines on the basis of adenovirus, because of this very rare side effect. And people worry that this clotting uh, problem would be a reason to not take the vaccines. But what we say and encourage is really just take the vaccines. There is a well-balanced risk benefit the European Medicines Agencies has reviewed that, many learned societies have reviewed that, and the overall conclusion is the benefits far, far, far outweigh the risks of these vaccines. And I personally also had one of the adenovirus vaccines without hesitation. One is just the sheer size of the need which is huge. We hear a lot of discussion and complaints about the vaccination effort in Europe, but Europe so far is the only WHO region where all countries are actively vaccinating. So we're on the lucky side. There are parts of the world where access to vaccines is far less, and that's a concern because this pandemic will not be over until it's over globally. So that's one challenge. So how do we get the world vaccinated? So that means we need a range of vaccines, including vaccines that are not so picky when it comes to the cold chain. What we see now with the messenger RNA vaccines is that they work very well, but they need to be stored at minus 70 degrees, which is just simply not possible in parts of the world. So we need solutions there. And the third uh, challenge, and that's a longer term challenge, is how will this virus evolve? Will we start to see variants that truly escape from the vaccine immunity? And will we need to update the vaccines in the future just 
like we need to do with other pathogens, particularly the, the best example is influenza virus. So those are the challenges ahead. We have a good feel now for the explosive phase of the pandemic in Wuhan that really started in December. There was the involvement of a certain market that was not the whole story. There was also circulation beyond that. And there are leads from the market in that it sold wild animal products coming from regions which uh, have wild animal farming, but where we also know that there's quite a high uh, presence of SARS-like viruses in the bat population. So there's potential opportunity for spillover. So that's where that sort of concluded saying, okay, no, there was not widespread circulation months before the first alert, which some people think that's not the case. I think you use the right word, speculation and accusation. And the problem with that is very difficult to prove a negative in science. We discussed uh, this question with colleagues from the three laboratories that have been involved in Wuhan. So the laboratories of the Public Health Institute and Research uh, uh, Institute that specializes in bat viruses. We discussed their research, their work, uh, their activities. We looked at their laboratories. We discussed their lab security setup. We discussed uh, how they monitor the health of their staff, uh, the testing of their staff. And we found nothing that really gave us the impression this is a lead to follow. And that's how far you can go as, you know, scientifically. There are people that say, but what if you don't believe what people have told you? Well, that's where it all ends. What we do is look at the scientific evidence, and we found not a grain of evidence for a lab escape theory.